are you guys hey got to apologize we we didn't have a show last week uh joe cardinal had to leave town he went to hollywood to audition for the role of rapunzel in the latest release from disney and we're waiting to find out if he got the part but yeah things came up we couldn't get our schedules to jive and we've been hit with horrible weather which is making things very difficult uh to get things done but we are back how you doing joe how you doing nico me i'm tired man it's a long day today um uh, yeah i was out of commission last week and that's part of what made us miss our our normal rotation i had gotten the second covid shot and that laid me out man so i was i, I pretty much lost a week of everything work training you name it but i'm you know back in the grindstone now but i had to be at downtown at 5 30 this morning for some upgrade we we're doing so i'm dragging now man i'm feeling it what? how about you nico oh not, not much man you're nico what right what happened just... to what happened to you with the shot joe well so the one i'm Here getting we the, go the pfizer shot uh so it's two parts right you get one you wait 21 days and then you get the second one and uh you know i've done because I work in healthcare, they require that we get flu shots and stuff. And I'm always, it's never had an impact on me, but I kept hearing rumors. It's like, oh yeah, that second one, it's different. That one really hits you. And man, did I get it by, I'd say like, I got it in the morning and by that night. So like 12 hours later, I was feeling chills and aches and uh, the chills really didn't subside. And until the next day, I actually took my temperature and I had 103.5 fever. So, I mean, it was like bad, like, you know, like I said, like strong flu symptoms. And I started taking meds and taking a shower to bring my temperature down and I was able to get it in control, but I definitely for like 48 hours, I was just like, I was worthless, more than worthless than usual, I guess would be the phrase. But uh, yeah, it was, and I've talked to a lot of people because everybody at my work, you know, they were lucky enough at our work to have, you know, they really want everybody at the hospital to be immunized. And so no one's been hit like this with that so it was it was kind of surprising so anyways take your mileage may vary but be forewarned if you're going to do it well i've noticed if it's a coincidence i don't know but as of last week my phone i keep getting these pop-ups saying joe cardinal is now on the train joe cardinal is now in chicago joe cardinal is now at the adult bookstore it's like my phone is tracking you since you got that second shot. Yeah, I was going to say now, whenever I look at the Bluetooth at my phone, my name and social security shows up. It's weird. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you may be getting a package that was uh, meant for me. They may have delivered it to your house. I don't know, because your credit card numbers did come up on my phone. I just figured I'd test it out. So if you get that Lamborghini, uh, it's coming to my house, please. So, so at least, are you, are you contact tracing him? Hmm? So Tony's contact tracing you. Exactly. <laughs> you know, speaking of cars, because of the literally uh, sub freezing and single digit temperatures, my car has not been able to get out of my driveway for over, or going out two and a half, three weeks. Well, three weeks. I have not been able to get my car out, and I can't get anybody to help push it. I've tried. I can't do it. Well, Joe felt it good enough to drive all the way over to my house on Sunday and him and I together couldn't push the dog, the dog on thing. My car is literally, I mean, we tried everything. It's on ice. My, you know, the way the driveway is, it's not, um, 
black topped. It's not concrete. It's just gravel. You know, when the, and the owners of the house, uh, you know, they, they're not going to do anything with it, but you know, the thing is, so you get puddles, you get little undulations and it's frozen solid. So I don't think I'll be able to get that car out um, until spring because it, it sits low. It's a sportier car. It's an older car, but it's a, you know, I had modifications done to it. It sits low. So once before I had to get it towed and every, we had to push it out onto the street for the tow truck to hook it up. So it, it won't do me any good. I, I can't get that car out. So that's why I had to take your uh, credit information, Joe. And, and I just figured, you know, you wouldn't mind if I got a Lamborghini after all, you know, we're all Italians. We got to keep it, you know, keep it in the family. Well, I think you gotta, you gotta kind of go like the way Nico is. I think the sports cars are your problem there. When you're living up in the, the great wilderness, like you are, you really need something a little bit more, you know, oh, four by that, four or something. Uh, that reminds me, I, <laughs> you know, I wasn't sure if I put all the information for the Lamborghini with your credit info correctly. So like, just to be on the safe side, um, I bought a house under your name, so I won't be living like here. I mean, you know, I mean, I won't, I mean, you can still get a hold of me. I mean, you know, Palm Springs, California, isn't like that far away, but, um, you know, it might just, actually getting you that far away might be worth the price now that you've mentioned it. So this is, it's kind of what, no, another one, yet another win-win in the snap, no tap podcast. We have hey. so many of those. Hey, you know what? I, we talked about this before and I completely forgot, but when I said Palm Springs, remember a few weeks ago, guys, I told you to remind me to tell you about uh, the Frank Sinatra story and my friend. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I think well, it's time. It's time. So I had a friend in Chicago whose name was John, but we called him either Latvian John because he was from Latvia or concrete John because he did concrete work. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, for some of you older people that are watching or listening, this may hit home with you. Well, for a time, you know, concrete John lived in California. And he happened to end up becoming best friends with a man who used to be a very famous actor by the name of Paul Burke. Now, Paul Burke hit it big, like in the forties and fifties, he was on a TV show called night in the city, I believe. And, uh, or something like that. I forgot. Uh, but 12 o'clock high was probably his big thing. Um, and he did a lot of other parts in movies and so on. Um, but anyway, they used to be drinking partners and blah, 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 and da, 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 da. So I'll try to make this short. Latvian John is a very big man, very gregarious, has that big, thick accent and everything. Tony, Tony, Tony. So he wanted to meet Frank Sinatra because Paul Burke and Sinatra were tight. Well, Paul Burke is like, yeah, I don't think so. Sinatra is kind of, you know, he's temperamental. Well, they met. It did not go over very well. Um, but Paul schmoozed it over, okay? And eventually, Latvian and John and Frank Sinatra became pals. They became not like bosom buddies, but friendly, very friendly. And Paul... Uh, kind of did his own thing and Latvian and John's hanging around and as time marches on, uh, Frank Sinatra hires Concrete John to do work around his, his mansion. So ironically, this is the moral, the point of the story. He needed some, some serious concrete work and uh, they were all supposed to be heading out to, uh, to Vegas. And it was a, a little entourage of Frank Sinatra, his mother and whomever else was going on this private airplane. And Frank was supposed to go. Well, Latvian and John is like, hey, Frank, I need you here at the house. There's a problem. We, we can't deal with this over the telephone. You got to come here. So Sinatra's like, all right, all right, all right, I'll go. Sinatra shows up at the house and, you know, his mom and everybody flies off to Las Vegas. Well, sadly, the plane crashes 
and Sinatra's mom and everybody on board is killed. Frank would have been on that airplane if it wasn't for my friend, Concrete John, having to have him over at the house for, uh, you know, to whatever it was that needed to be done. And Frank had to be there for this process. Strange but true. Isn't that weird? And I used to love it when when John would bring in pictures. He is, you know, the old photo albums, and he would bring them into the bar of him and Paul Burke and Sinatra and this Dean Martin and you name it, whatever, just celebrities back from the like early 70s, I guess, late 60s, early 70s, whenever these were taken. But um, interesting story. And so I asked Concrete John, I'm like, man, what about me and Sinatra? He's like, forget about it, man. You guys, no way. <laughs> you guys would have clashed. It would not have worked out. <laughs> Frank Sinatra, I guess, was very particular on who he would let in. And he had to be like the alpha male. And it, him and I would have clashed. But it wouldn't have worked out. But that's okay. I still like to sing his songs at karaoke. It would have been a great story if you had like top wrist locked him or something. Now that's a way to get famous. Yeah, well, Conc I this is... I mean, I knew John, Lat Latvian Concrete John. I, I knew him long after, I mean, you know, long after he was done with Sinatra. Oh, I mean, okay. So he couldn't have. Oh, Sinatra, him. don't forget, Frank Sinatra died in 1998. Okay. Um, so I, I knew Latvian John, like right around there. I think I started to know him. 90, let's see. Yeah, I think I knew him after Frank Sinatra had died. Yeah, I think 90. 99,000. You know, it's interesting, that story, because you wonder, I mean, I think we've all heard a lot of stories like that in our life growing up where, you know, if it wasn't for one decision or one person, one last minute change of mind, you know, I mean, I knew, I had talked to at least two different people, you know, through my work, because we get a lot of consultants and different people and who are in the building, you know, on 9-11, not to bring up any, you know, past debates we've had about 9-11, but they, they got out, you know, or actually, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this is true that my brother-in-law actually was supposed to be there that for like a conference or something, some business meeting, and he opted out for a reason. And granted, it's a, obviously a very big, um, you know, complex and, and you know, there's, there's, you know, thousands of people every day who, who are going there, but it's still kind of, to your point about missing that plane crash, I mean, the decision to go on that plane or get in that car you know, what do you think? Do you think that's just Fear coincidence luck. or do you... No, I was just reading something. Well, first of all, I don't remember all the little intricate details of why or how Sinatra ended up, you know, it was just because of Concrete John. But I read something today, uh, and I didn't go in depth, but it was some mathematician. Um, actually, uh, Cursus Diaconus is his name, and the reason I know it... Um, is because he was a well, he's still alive, but he was a professional magician, very, very good card manipulator and so on. But he's a scientist, mathematician, whatever. And yeah, he was talking about uh, odds and how things that just seem like this is impossible to happen uh, are not really that impossible. Um, and he got into the math on it. But, you know, the main thing is he said at the time of this article, there was like 280 million people in America. So he says, just think something that's one in a million happens 280 times a day. Okay. So these kind of things, um, there's, there's, there's a, oh, I'm, I'm going back now into my uh, psychology apophenia. I believe that is what it, uh, the uh, psychological term, apophenia. And a lot of conspiracy theorists fall into this, where they think this can't happen. The odds are too great. Uh, so there has to be something going on here, uh, blah, blah, blah. That's called apophenia. And in normally, I mean, not that there aren't conspiracies, but generally there is an explanation, Occam's razor or whatever. But mathematically, many times, there is an explanation. So to get to your point, Joe, about what do you think about all of this? I, I mean, who really knows? But I would think it, it's sheer coincidence. Where do you draw the line? I could, I could extrapolate this out and feel guilty about Kevin getting killed in the plane crash because maybe by knowing me, 
And since we were into hot, hot rods and he high performance shit, you know, maybe I had something to do with him getting that airplane that ultimately crashed. You don't know. So no. I don't want I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. No, it has nothing to do with you. Just I like don't you think said. so. Just... Thank you, Nico. Thank you. Because somebody tried to pin yeah. that on me once. No. So who, who who do you think would win in a fight? Dean Martin or Frank Sinatra? Oh, well, Dean Martin used to box. Okay. Dean Martin's from my neck of the woods. He was from Steubenville, Ohio. I was from Cleveland. So he was roughly 90 miles southeast. He was right on the border, Youngstown. and No, no. Dean Martin had some boxing training. No, Sinatra... Although Sinatra was probably a better dancer, he might have been able to, you know, run away. He might have been faster, but <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going with Dean Martin. Work. All right, you're bringing <laughs> it up. You're bringing up a good subject here. This, I don't know how prepared I am, but there used to be some tough actors. Now I'm not talking trained actors per se. You know, like uh, Van Dam. Yeah, anybody. Oh yeah, any martial art guy or something like that. But. Here's another name that I, if I would have known we were going to do this, I could have looked this up and I could have read the direct quote because I saved it on my computer. But there was an actor. He was mainly a B movie actor, but or not a B movie, but uh, never like the superstar, but always like the co-star and stuff like that. All right. His name was Ralph Meeker. And he actually played in one of my favorite movies of all time. And my friend Holly, who likes to watch my videos, Holly, I got her to watch this. Uh, it was called Birds of Prey, starring David Jansen. And he was the detective in the movie. Um, he was also in um, The Dirty Dozen. All right. So Ralph Meeker was supposedly very tough. And this one actor was saying, Meeker was tough. He was super, super tough. He was a damn good wrestler. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe it when I read that because he doesn't look like a wrestler, right? Um, he, but, yeah, so supposedly Ralph Meeker was tough. Another guy that was tough was um, Rod Taylor, who was actually a, uh Australian. Um, he, he lost his accent purposely for a lot of roles in America, but Rod Taylor was supposed to be a uh, pretty tough dude too. You know, just, you know, fisticuff tough. Um, so that's something that we should, you know, let me prepare and go through my old notes and we'll have a show on, you know, some of the toughest actors in Hollywood that you wouldn't think were, you know, that you weren't, you wouldn't think were tough. We should do that. Yeah, that'd be interesting. And not only actors, just like, uh, famous people in general, like uh, who who was a good wrestler and who who was actually tough, you know, a tough person. Like Abraham Lincoln, he was supposedly a wrestler, and I think Teddy Roosevelt, and I'm sure there's so many, so many more that we just are not really aware of. Well, Roosevelt did judo. He kind of got into that until he saw a catch wrestler snuff out the judo man. Um, but yeah. Teddy Roosevelt was was very uh, he was he was like Kevin, <laughs> you know. He did a lot of stuff, you know. He was an adventurous guy. Um, well, I shouldn't even say it was a judo man back then. It was jujitsu, but Japanese, not not what you would think of of as Brazilian jujitsu or whatever. But um, same stuff. They did a lot of ground stuff, uh, you know, submissions. But uh, yeah, no, there there was a lot of people that you would be surprised could could handle themselves and conversely people that you think are tough really weren't so i don't want to go down there because i don't want to disparage anybody i'd rather um build it up but um yeah interesting stuff you know musicians too there were some hard-ass musicians as well was, was abraham lincoln a catch wrestler they called it rough and tumble i mean you know what these guys used to goof around i mean look at kids you know, sometimes kids are just toss and turn, and that's kind of what it was. They, I was always told it was called rough and tumble wrestling, but you could say it was catch wrestling because technically catches catch any hold you can, you know. Um, so, yeah, it would it would be – but it, it wasn't as advanced. It was by no – you know, he wouldn't do well, you know, compared to people nowadays or even high school kids. But um, everybody – 
pretty much wrestled and then later on boxed. I mean, maybe not professionally or at a high level, but there weren't a lot of sports. And, you know, I can tell you this from my grandfather who raised me, he was a boxer, but all of his friends that I met, this is World War II era, they all did some boxing, okay? That was just the thing you did. You know, everybody did it. Like maybe nowadays everybody dabbles a little bit in some sort of martial art, you know, taekwondo or whatever it may be, you know? Um, but, yeah, there wasn't a lot to do. You know, there wasn't a lot of organized sports. And, you know, get, get, get a load of this. You know, when you're talking about Depression era or even back in Lincoln's time, log cabin shit, you know, <laughs> there, there weren't any team sports back then. But even in the Depression era, who had money for all of that? You didn't. That's why I heard soccer got so popular because the kids could literally just play with with cans or just anything round. You know, it, it, it's all you need is a ball. Is, you know? isn't, isn't that where catch wrestling became more popular was in the Depression era because people could bet on it and, you know, try to try to win money? And, uh, you know, the, it could just be average guys just trying to make a buck on the streets. Well, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's, it was, people were doing everything in the depression, but let's just make one thing perfectly clear. There was a lot of shenanigans going on in everything, a lot of cheating going on in everything back then, any kind of advantage a person could get, they would take to make the money. I mean, there was just no money. You know, you're talking nickels and dimes, but the professional wrestling was all fake. That was 100% phony shit back then in the Great Depression. Every so often, you'd have a legit shoot match. But for general speaking, it's all entertainment. You know, it always has been. But, um, yeah, those guys, it was interesting, just like boxing, too. You know, guys would say sometimes, like my grandfather would tell me this in the bars back then, um, nobody wanted to fight guys like my grandfather or others that were pro fighters or something, but they kind of wanted to get a taste of what it would be like. So they would, they would literally say, Hey, for X amount of money. Now, not a lot of money by today's standards, but maybe like a dollar back then, which was like a day's pay, you know? So whatever the amount was, I'll go for one minute. You can go with me for one minute. I won't hit you hard. I won't hit you in the face. You know, I'll hit you in the body and, you know, just for one minute, they would just do it. Nobody's going to get hurt. You know, so in late, I actually saw this happen years later with a former champion fighter. Um, he was messed up and he, he was living up above a bar in Cleveland and he came downstairs and he made that offer. Does anybody want to go with me, you know, for 10 bucks? And it almost brought tears to my eyes. I was so upset by this because he was a world champion. He was a monster fighter, boxer. And to see, you know, I don't want to mention his name. He's no longer with us, but I don't want to mention his name. But you could probably do the math uh, and figure it out. But he, um, it was sad to see that. You know, he was a smaller guy. He wasn't a heavyweight or anything like that. But to see, to see him there at that point in his life, it bothered me, man. It, re it just bothered me. But w in my grant in, in the depression era around then th it wasn't because they were doped up or whatever it was there anywhere, any way to make them, you know, a little bit of money. But, um, what, what do you think about the, the carnival wrestlers guys that would just, some of it was okay, but a lot of it was setups too. You know, you, you would have plants in the studio audience. Okay. Um, so not all of it. Again, this is the carnivals here. Carnies are, you know, a lot of those things are rigged. Many, you know, the gamings, the games and everything else, a lot of times they got shut down. But with the carnival stuff to take on all comers, or you would have a combo man that could box and wrestle, every so often, yeah, you know, they'd they'd let they they'd let somebody win, you know, just to um build up the crowd. Because if you're wiping everybody out, who's gonna want to challenge you? But if you go up against somebody like, you know, OK, like maybe they'll have somebody like me in the studio audience. OK, I'm a plant. I'm on their team. You know, I'll go up there and 
you know, I know enough. I'll look, I mean, I won't show him everything I got, but just enough. I'll beat the guy. Right. And then that gives somebody else in the audience, you know, uh, enthusiasm and okay, I could do it. I'm better than that Tony fella. And then he gets taken out. So there was a lot of, it's, you know, there's a lot of shenanigans, man. Believe me. Um, and sometimes to be honest, the wrestlers that they had were not really even super duper skilled. Okay. Some of them were just, they looked the part. So they would insulate that. They would make sure that everybody was, you know, already, um, you know, pre pre screen. We're not going to get anybody studly. Now on the flip side, there was a, an old time wrestler. We're going back, you know, the, the early 1900s, you know, the teens and everything. His name was Fred Grubmeyer, and he played. He was a he was a hustler, okay. And Lou Fez told this story that you know Grubby would come to a town, a little small town, and dress in overhauls and all of this shit, and he would be the village idiot. He would show up as the fool, okay. I can beat anybody in town in horseshoes. I I that's my thing. I'm a horseshoe player. And he'd get his ass handed to him. Okay. Yeah. I can, but pool, I'm even better at pool. And he'd bet money and he'd lose his ass at pool. Whatever he'd lose. And finally, he's like, I don't have that much money left, but, you know, I'm going all in. I can out wrestle anybody. Well, by, you know, by the time his shtick was played out, I mean, everybody thought this guy is a chump. Oh, we're going to bet, we're going to bet the farm on this guy. Well, that was his hustle. Nobody could take him. I mean, he was a legitimate shooter. The guy could, the guy could really wrestle, and that's how he, you know, he ringed these guys. It's classic. Wow, it's a con. But see, here's the that's thing. That's great. <laughs> oh, you know, I could tell you many, many stories about about cons like that, about hustles and, and whatever. Because when you have the skill, okay, when you're really, 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 really talented, uh, it it can be overwhelming. Okay, and especially. Or you're you're so talented in something that you can't really legitimately make a lot of money at, right? So therefore, you 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 play these little cons, card card mechanics and card cheats and card manipulators were really good at that. Okay, um, they would they would set you up. They would lose throughout the day or throughout the night. Excuse me, you know they're not winning every hand. I mean that would be too obvious. They're going to let, let's say the three of us are playing, although we would normally play with more people. But let's say there's five. That, that's a little more, you know, four to five people. Um, and normally you'd have a guy that's called a shortstop or third base, you know, shortstop in pool, but third base at cards. That's a guy that's kind of in on it with you. But even if you're there by yourself, I'm going to let you win, Nico. You're going to win some money. Okay. Joe. Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll probably let you win some money. You know, if if I feel physical, especially like some physical threat from somebody, I want to make sure you're going to win. I only have to win three or four strategic hands, okay? It's not like the movies where I'm going to break everybody. You know, everybody's going to leave flat busted and I got all the cheese. No, no, no. That's when you're going to get your, your, your thumbs broken your hands cut up or you're shot dead. No, no, no. So these guys did this as a living. Okay. And they would make the circuits. So they may be in your town, you know, somewhere in Indiana, and then they'll, they're going to come back through after they start heading East on their way back, they're going to hit somewhere in Indiana again. So they can't make enemies. All right. So they'll take enough money that they're comfortable now, but not enough that you don't want to see them again. They'll take just enough that you want to see them again so they can get their money back. And that's the beauty of it. Um, when you're that talented at something, you can, you can toy with people. And unfortunately, uh, Rubes, you know, the suckers that fall for this, you know, if you've, if you've done your thing right, they'll, they'll go to their grave never knowing that they've been had. Okay. They'll never know. And, uh, you know, that's, it's, it, 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 you're living on the fringe. You know, I highly suggest to anybody watching or listening to read up about a guy 
a guy named Titanic Thompson. Read up about him, Ty. Titanic, like the ship, Thompson. Absolutely incredible uh, history with this guy. He was probably, probably, that we know of, the greatest hustler America has ever seen. And he didn't die all that long ago. I think he died in the early 70s. Okay, but he was through the heart of the Roaring Twenties and the Depression and Arnold Rothstein and, you know, fixing the World Series. And, you know, they even claimed that he had something to do with killing Arnold Rothstein. Okay, and apparently he killed five people, this Titanic Thompson. Don't think he ever did time. But this guy had incredible skill. He could pull cons that were unbelievable. All right. Uh, And some of it is. Uh, you know, some of it's pure talent, but others are kind of like, you know, a trick. Okay. Like, um, yeah, it's just, it's just amazing what, what people can do when they have a lot of time on their hands. But, um, anyway, boy, did we, I don't know what, what we were talking about before we got sidetracked on that, but that, that was an interesting part of my life because I saw a lot of that shit growing up three card money, Pitching pennies, uh, dice games on the street. You know, I lived in the, in the ghetto in the inner, inner city. I mean, gambling was all over the place. Okay, um, there there wasn't like obviously pool tables out out on the street, but card games, you name it, all the time. Matter of fact, there used to be a card game called uh, Speed, and or was it Swift Speed? And I won my high school speed championship. And I'll never forget, it came down between me and a girl named Evelyn Hill. And uh, we were the, we were in the finals. And it was a great, just a legit, no tricks, you know, just just fun card games. But, yeah, I used to love to play cards and, of course, shoot pool. But um, when, I came, when it came to pool, I've talked about this before. I never hustled. I always let everybody know, hey, I'm a good player, you know. And I would always, you know, normally I'll try my best. If we're playing for money, I'm going to, I'm going to try my best. If I don't care, you know, if we're just playing for the hell of it, or I like you and I'm I'm not interested, I won't really try hard. So, you know, but that doesn't matter because there's no wager on the game. But when there's a wager going on, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to dump. I'll, I'll do my best. You think they could pull off a circus wrestling like they did in the past? No. They could pull it off nowadays with everybody knowing MMA. Well, that, yeah, for for sure that. But I just, the risk of injury. I mean, see, those guys back then, I mean, I did that. I did one show. I did I did a, a strongman show, um, and then I challenged. I took on all comers. I challenged anybody. Well, nobody would nobody would take me up on it. You know, I was in peak shape. I'm bending bars and snapping nails, you know, before, you know, this was because we were, I was, te- we were going to, I was teaching at a martial arts school that was about to open. And this was part of the show. We did a demo. The guys did their rest, uh, their martial arts stuff, and I did a little bit of, you know, the feats of strength and some wrestling. I demonstrated catch wrestling. Nobody, in, nobody had ever seen it out here. And uh, and then afterwards, all right, the the MC said, and he was really cool. He's like, yeah, right, yeah, blah blah blah. He was like a good talker. Tony will take on all comers. You know, nobody can last sixty seconds. Well, nobody wanted to come up. Nowadays, you might get challengers, and then what are you going to do? You know, you're going to take him out. You're going to you're going to snuff the guy. I mean, and then get sued for breaking his arm or something. No. Shoney, you were talking to Shoney. He was doing something similar to that. Those underground, if you want to call it that, underground fights. So yeah. they had that, you know. But that's quite different than. I mean, I'm not. I mean, what Shoney did was he's going up against other guys who had had training or should at least have training. Um. But I don't know. I mean, I've I can tell you this. Back in the late '80s, when I was playing pool on the road, I mean, I was I was a good pool player back then. I was playing very well. I went to a carnival, and they had a pool table set up. Okay, smaller pool table, and it was just you had to make three balls. And I don't I don't exactly even remember what it was. It was a trick table. It was gaffed. Okay, and I tried twice, and I knew right away that it was a gaff table. And I smiled at the guy and he kind of knew there was trouble. The minute I sat down to shoot, you know, when I bent down and got into my stance, he knew that I was a player. 
And then I just quit. I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't going to rabble rouse the guy, you know, okay. You know, I get it. And you could tell he, he kind of gave me like the look like, okay, thanks for leaving. You know, um, so there would have to be an angle to it, Nico. If anybody was going to try to pull that off nowadays, you know, they'd, they'd have to have an angle. It was they'd a have, lot easier. Back yeah, then. they'd have to have some plants inside the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. I mean, kids nowadays, we don't, everybody wrestles. I mean, da-da-da. I mean, back then, it wasn't that popular. I mean, you, 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 you fooled around. You guys would goof around, but there there you know as far as high level uh wrestling you know it would have been you know the odds of you running into somebody like that um would have been kind of low i mean i'm not saying it couldn't have happened and i'm not saying somebody you know didn't do it didn't show up and do it but um there's a lot of stipulations too so on that note now that you bring that up uh I don't know. Should I mention a guy's name? No, I won't. But there was a former, I believe he was a national champion wrestler, okay, who turned pro, and uh, he turned out to be like a policeman, okay? For those of you who don't know what that is, it's the, you know, you're the one who handles all the ruffians. Let's just keep it that way. So the promoter, the local promoter, made this challenge, and it was an extraordinary amount of money. It was something like $1,000. You know, for anybody that could last X amount of time with, let's call him Wrestler X. And Wrestler X was a basically a super heavyweight. And um, I got this story. I heard this story straight from Wrestler X. He didn't tell me personally. I saw a video of him telling the story, so it's true. They brought up some local karate instructor. And apparently this karate instructor was, for the most part, built like a string bean. And uh, Wrestler X said, hey, man, I don't think we should pull this off on this guy. Uh, because let's backtrack. Wrestler X knew some submissions, but he, he knew he was taught these bullshit holds. And he was probably smart enough to know these holds have limitations. And that's exactly what he was afraid of. This, this guy was going to be so limber and da-da-da-da-da. So sure as heck, he got this karate man into his Sunday hold, man, and it just wasn't working. It just didn't work. The guy won. The, the karate man won the bet, and the, um, the promoter didn't want to pay off. Okay, So there was a lot of trouble there, Okay, where the karate guy, I don't remember the rest of it because it didn't interest me, the follow-up, but I believe, you know, he was going to go to the law or the law got involved or some, something like that. Um, what, what was so, the bet? He, he just had to last a certain amount yeah, of time. Yeah, he had to last him. a certain amount of time. And, you know, the whole idea was that Wrestler X was going to get him in his Sunday hold. And the guy was going to either go to sleep or tap out or, you know, whatever. Whatever he could do, get him in a submission of some sort. But um didn't work. Did not work. And I, you know, and I would have known that. I mean, because the submissions weren't the way that we put him on us <laughs> that way. So he had, but he knew, he just, he just knew that he, we, this is nothing, no, no knock on wrestler X. I mean, he was cool about it. He's like, he knew there was going to be trouble. This was not going to work on this guy. You know, when you're a bigger dude, especially like when you're muscular or you lift weights, part of the problem when you're like that is you become very tight. Okay. And when, even if you're not a weightlifter, just a bigger guy, your, your breathing becomes restricted. Your neck gets a little bit, you know, you don't have that motion, the range of motion, like somebody who's a little bit more lift. Okay. So really it's generally speaking, I'll paint with a broad brush here. It's, you know, it's not that difficult to tap out a big, stronger guy, because like I say, their joints, man, especially if they're constantly lifting anybody who's lifted, you know, you're always walking around with some sort of pain, right? Um, so you really have to work on your protagonist and antagonistic muscles, and you have to stretch and do all these exercises, you know, for your arms, you know, um, so you can be loose enough to fight off these submission holds if somebody would get them in, get them on you. But now when you're not 
trained as a submission fighter, you're just, let's say, a weightlifter or just a heavy set guy, you know, you're more susceptible to these holds. So um, Wrestler X knew, hey, this is a black belt. This guy owns a martial arts school. He's not, you know, he's an athlete. I, I'm going to, this, this may be a problem here. Now, if it was a straight wrestling match, pin or something like that, that's a whole different story. But, um, but yeah, no, this was, so you got to be careful about all that jazz. I remember when I did Taekwondo, my instructor, man, he was like Gumby. He could put his, he put his foot to his face, like standing up against the wall, put his foot behind his face and the other leg extended. I mean, that would be a really tough guy to submit. In any well, you can, but that's where the twists, that's where like what I teach about, you know, Joe found, maybe Joe could talk about the spaghetti thing. Um, but it's, it's all about knowing the science. This is why when I say what I do is at the highest level, technically it is because what we do, it doesn't matter where you're at. You, you can get this guy once you understand the principles of a twist, because even these ultra flexible people that have a, um, a medical condition that allows them to have extreme elasticity it's only so much. I mean, their head's not going to spin around like, you know, the exorcist over here. I mean, maybe in Joe's world, but not in our world. Right. So there are limits to a, to a human flex to the, you know, human flexibility. And that's why you as the submission guy, if you go up against somebody like that, if you're used to just putting on a top wrist lock like this, it ain't, you're never going to get it. Okay. But when you're used to doing the twists and, you know, double wrist locks and just keep on adjusting for the twist when you realize this is the highest way of doing it, then you'll get these guys. You'll get them to submit. And sadly, as we, and I don't want to go, I don't really want to talk about martial arts today, but, you know, we were, as we were discussing with Javier, in so many tournaments, all these twists and these high uh, percentage, you know, the, the, the most dangerous ways of doing the holes, they're barred. They're, they're, they're forbidden. So, these guys never know it. So yeah, your, your karate Taekwondo instructor, I should say, probably would have been difficult for those guys to submit. Um, yeah, you'll never get them in a banana split. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> well, now there, now there you go. Now that's exactly right. A banana split, uh, maybe even, you know, um, a spladal or an abdominal stretch on a mat. You know, those are uh, moves that you, when you do them, you are putting yourself almost at your limit. Okay. So when, so there's no more, you're fully, let's put it, let's use this term. You as the, as the protagonist, as the guy putting the hold on, you are at, you are fully extended. Okay. There's no more that you can go with that. But with, with toe holds and double wrist locks and top wrist locks and, you know, cranks, that's not the case. Cause you can keep on readjusting like this. You can keep on twisting and getting, you know, getting the, uh, you can make it super tight, but you have to understand it and, you know, and be aware of it and practice it relentlessly. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, I've known, I've known world-class people at, at, you know, things like chess and, and, you know, stuff like that. You know, when you're, when you're really, really, really good at something, um, you know, sometimes it's better to schmooze someone. Don't show your ass, as they say. Just hold a little back or maybe hold a lot back. Um, because you can blow people out of the water and then, then they'll be done with you. You know, they'll be like, forget this. You know. Um, so sometimes just showing a little bit will get you all the cheese, man. But showing everything, sometimes no. Yeah, it seems like uh, leg locks and the heel hooks, you really can't – you can't be flexible enough for those. I mean, there's – your That's ankle can only move about. so much. Because you're going after the tendons and everything. And, yeah, you can only go so much. Yeah. But, you know, I still see people not tapping to them and not getting injured either. But they're not tapping because genuinely the, the hold isn't affecting them because it's just not done properly. It becomes a strength move. You know, especially toe holds and things like that. Um, you know, it it 
Achilles locks or whatever, they don't have it on right. Uh, they're missing the, the fine details of it. Look, the quickest, the simplest explanation I can give to anybody out there listening is you have to put as much of your body weight behind every move as possible. It's all about <clears throat> structure. You have to be properly structured. You cannot be like a scarecrow where you're out like this, extended all the way, you know. Uh, you're weak. You've made yourself completely weak. You have to unite. The closer your limbs are to your torso, the stronger you are, period. Okay? This is just, this is just science. So when you see guys having to lift, I've seen people put a double wrist lock on and they're lifting a guy up. You've weakened yourself, pal. That's not the way to do it. That is a show hold. You're lifting to show the audience, look, look, I have his arm. See, everybody? See? So if you have to do stuff like that, and you may not even been been told this, you know, you don't know. You're just doing what you were told and your coach was doing what he was told. It's it's not the right way to do it. Like my, like my coach said, done right, these holds, nobody should see what the hell you're doing. It's ironic, but the, the cries of fake should happen when the hold is put on right as opposed to when it's not because the done the way that I do them and the way I've shown you guys, it's so subtle. Like Javier was discussing. It's just so, so finite that you might miss it on a video that makes all the difference in the world. And that's why we get people to scream and tap when it looks like nobody's doing anything to them. That happened yeah. when Ron came out to the gym. Do you remember that? Which Ron? I've trained so uh, Ron Almaria. He came out just to kind of see, you know, oh. he didn't, you know, he's like, hey, you know, because he wanted to see how legit it was. And you were putting some, you were putting the top wrist lock on me. And he kept shaking his head. He's like, why is he tapping? Why is he freaking out? And I'm like, well, get down on the mat. You know, <laughs> let's show you. And I said, just be ready to tap, Ron, because he couldn't see what was happening. I mean, literally, as you described. Yeah. And I remember his eyes bugging out when we did the double wrist lock on him, but he just, yeah, he couldn't see what was happening. He was expecting to see more, you know, he's like, why is Joe, you know, panicking and tapping out right away? He couldn't see it, you know, until he felt it himself. Then he, yeah. But yeah. I mean, it's like, I always say this, it's like when you watch, you know, a movie star kiss a beautiful woman kiss, you can see what she's doing. You don't know what it feels like because you're, you're not actually kissing her. You, you don't get that experience. And yeah, I mean, when I put it on somebody, it's, I've said it, when I put these holds on, it's, you know, unforgettable, really, because it's, it's nobody else. You, you, they're not going to get that anywhere else, okay? Um, you should have these guys screaming, literally, or tapping before the hold is even put on, and you know that. I've done it so many times with so many fighters that it just gets like, well, I don't even want to do it because I can't even put the hold on yet. You're already tapping. I don't even have it on yet. So I'll back it off, and then, then I'll do it, and, and now you'll, you'll see. And even then, I've never hooked anybody that I'm training. They don't even know what that's like, you know, to actually get hooked. God forbid, you know, you don't want to do that. You don't want to have to hook somebody ever that you're training unless, you know, it turns into a, something they shouldn't have turned it into. Um, so in reality, they'll never know the full, 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 Monty here, but they'll know, you know, they know they end up knowing enough. Um, you really have to be careful though when with the neck manipulations. That's what you want to watch out for. And even chokeholds, especially when you're dealing with somebody a little bit older or maybe somebody who's isn't in the you know very fit, because you don't want any of that plaque to break loose uh in in, the, in an artery and and you know give somebody a stroke. Everybody thinks chokes are safe, but they're not. Um, there, there's many things that could go wrong. So you really have to make sure that the opponent, uh, the training partner is, you know, healthy fit. Everybody really should have a thorough examination, um, you know, and, and make sure you're, you're healthy. Um, and as far as leg locks, you know, the, the, the thing is, you know, just do them with like anything else with patience, with a little bit of, uh, but don't be in a rush. Don't be in a hurry. Just, I, I would rather you quit, tap out, let's call it, sooner than later so you don't get injured. Because remember something here. If you're complaining about, I, he didn't have me, hold it, hold it, hold it. 
Time out, man. Calm down. This is not a competition here. This is your gym partner. You don't ever beat your gym partner. You know, excuse me, that's, it's not a competition. You're there to help each other out, okay, to develop and grow together, okay? So what you'll say is, okay, I didn't quite feel it. All right, I'm tapping. I don't, I don't quite, you didn't quite have it, but you would have, okay? You, you, you help them, okay? Leave your ego at the doorstep. You don't play this macho game. Because what will happen is if you don't give him that interplay, the guy may think he's totally lost it and he's going to keep on maybe adjusting and all of a sudden, boom. And it doesn't have to be a toe hold. It doesn't have to be a heel hook. It can be anything. It could be an arm bar. It could be a neck crank. It could be anything. So you got to let your opponent uh, – I call him opponent. Your training partner to know, hey, okay, okay, all right, all right, you're getting it. You know, you're there. You're close. You know, and then and give him feedback. And, and – he or she should give you the feedback as well when it's your turn. It's all about, man, it's all about camaraderie and helping each other. Hello. Yeah, I think I, I learned some of that the hard way. I was too stubborn to tap out when I first started martial arts. So I remember getting my neck cranked and just hearing like several vertebrae popping and I was too stubborn to tap. And I do I didn't really feel pain so much at that moment, but um, yeah. Then years later, I'm just feeling like all these pains sticking around. It's like, man, I should have just tapped. It was stupid. What well, is tough finding good partners? You know, people who you can trust. I mean, but that's the. It goes both ways. Obviously, you got to be a good partner too. You know, and like you said, be willing to tap out. You know, and yeah, you're right. I mean it's actually, I don't know if it's tougher when you're in a new gym and you don't know people, you know, once you, once you get a rapport with your training partners, you can give that feedback, you know, and, you know, I was just thinking about when we were training at, uh, you know, with Jason and Joe, I mean, we were definitely letting some heel hooks go for a little while, but we were never, I never felt like, oh, you know, he's going to, you know, he's well, just going to pop it on me, you know, like, so I mean, you were a little more, you weren't like a raw beginner either, but true, true. But I mean, it, so it can be done. I mean, a lot of things. And I remember him being kind of surprised. It's like, wow, I've, we've never taken, you know, in his other training, I have never taken a heel hook this far. But I mean, we, we, you know, when you knew you were in a danger zone, everybody kind of slowed down and say, okay, let's, let's play this out a little bit. You know, there was, like you said, there, I think because, uh, maybe the, the relationships that were there with, you know, no one was, no one cared necessarily that they were tapped out. It's like, okay, let's let the other guy get this now or, or, you, you know, whatever. I mean, it was, um, well, it's, it's bullshit. I mean, look, okay, here in the 25 or so years that I've been online and people have been emailing me, the vast majority of people who complain about where they train is the attitude of the gym. Okay. That's the number one complaint is the attitude. Okay. And that's a problem. Okay. You, you can't, you can't, the attitude has to be, you know, great. You, you've got to get along. You, you got to be productive and you can't be, you know, um, you know, dog food for, for, for the, for the champ of the gym. Okay. If there's one guy, like, you know, a lot of gyms will have one or two or three guys that are like uh, stars, right. They're going somewhere and they feed guys to, them. you know, like you're, you're, you're like a, a human friggin' wrestling dummy. And that's okay if that's what you want to do, but I mean, it's not it's not what you're paid for. You know, you're paying money there to learn, to 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 improve. And Angelo Dundee said it once. He's like, there are no knockdowns in my gym. Okay, now obviously it can happen. It can happen accidentally. No harm there. If it happens intentionally, that's a problem. I had to throw guys out of the gym because they they try to get wild. Um, but you know, Dundee said no knockdowns in my gym. That's not what we're here for. You're not here to beat each other up. You're here to help each other improve. So there is no quote unquote tap outs. All right. That's, that has to stop that even if that, 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 that two word, that phrase has to be thrown out because that's, that's a vernacular of losing. Okay. So it plants that damn seed in your head that, Oh, I just lost. How many times did you get tapped out at the gym tonight? Ergo, how many times did you get your ass kicked tonight? All right. <laughs> Nobody wants to pay money for that. 
Nobody's going to pay $150, $200 a month to come home and tell his girl, well, yeah, I got my ass kicked five times today. No. So get that tap out stuff out of your mind. That's, that's, that's bad because that's just going to hold you back. Okay. It shouldn't be about that. You're, you're, it's, it's like an exchange of ideas is what's happening here. These ideas happen to be physical as opposed to mental. So you're, you're playing out your ideas through your body and you're developing. I mean, ask anybody who's ever gone to a yoga class or a Taibo or whatever you want to call it, CrossFit, whatever it is, you know, they don't come home saying somebody beat them. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not like that. And it should not be this way in your training. You know, get that out of your mind, everybody. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. Today we were saying that we were going to keep it all positive and happy and lighthearted. It never seems to be that way. But I'm just saying, though. You know, I think that is I think that is a positive message, okay. you know, opposed to the way a lot of people look at it. Like it's, you know, I'm going there to win or to lose. or, You know, I'm going to I'm going to fight or die trying. Well, you're going to burn then, out. Then I they mean, get hurt. Yeah. Then they get hurt in the gym oh, or, sure. or, or they just get discouraged because they're like, oh, man, I'm getting my ass kicked so much. They're not. I mean, it's really it's it's what you're saying is like you got to look at it completely different. And I totally agree with that. Well, thanks, but you do. I mean, and another thing, you know, you people are not going to want to really, you know, what happens in the gym should stay in the gym. Okay. If you're out there experimenting and you get caught, you're just, you know, like me, when I'm practicing pool, I'll take a hard shot. I'll just, I'll try things that, you know, just, just because I want to experiment. Okay. And, you know, like if I'm playing some people that I know, I'm not trying to win. Because first of all, let me explain something to you. This is my philosophy in life. When I'm with my friends, people that I love, I want them to succeed. I want them to win at everything they do, everything. So if I'm better than them, why do I want to beat them and knock them down? I don't want that. I don't want to compete with them. I don't. I love them too much. So if we're in the case of shooting pool, I'm just going to experiment. Now, this doesn't mean that I... I still won't win. I could, but I'm not there to win. I don't care to win. I'm not going to throw the match, but I'm trying things that normally I ordinarily wouldn't do. And that's how it should be in the gym. Sometimes you need to stretch yourself. Okay. You need to extend yourself, so to speak, and experiment and try strategies or techniques um, and see where it'll get you. And if you get caught, so be it. All right. Now, all of a sudden, your damn training partner is going to be posting shit all over the Internet or going to the other gym because these guys seem to train at four or five different gyms sometimes, you know, and uh, Joe Blow's not so good. I tapped him out. No, that's, you, you know, you're you're not a healthy person to be around. OK, yeah. you don't need that kind of people in your life. OK, because if you want to get nasty, I OK. I was shooting pool with a guy out here, very good pool player. And um, as a matter of fact, we. You know, he ended up, he recruited me for, to play on his team. So um, we're practicing. And like I said, I'm just doing my thing, you know. And so he's, I know he's thinking, oh, maybe Tony's not as good as I thought he was. Long story short, he has him and his wife, they invite us all over for a party. I don't remember what it was, but it was in the wintertime, but it was just a party party. He had gotten a pool table at his house and nine footer and all this. So there's a bunch of people. We're all having a good time, man. There's beverages and everything. We're having fun. So we all decide we're just going to play pool. Well, 12 games later, I'm still the guy on the table. Nobody took me down. And, and he's like, Jesus. I'm like, I'll say his name. Well, no, I won't. I don't. Pete. I'm like, dude, when we play, when we're practicing during the week, we got, we got leagues. I'm, tr I'm trying things. I'm experimenting, you know, I'm trying new things. That's what it's all about. Cause I didn't have a pool table at home. So here, I'm going to have to, you know, practice now. But when we were at his house, I wasn't experimenting. I was letting it loose. And, you know, so that's the thing about the gym people, you know, you've got to really be kind, you know, would you like it if you were in a relationship with your wife or girlfriend and all they did was bitch at you all the time and, 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 and pick on your faults or try to win every argument or every discussion, or it's gotta be their television station. It's gotta be their radio station. Gotta be their movie. 
you'd be like, hey, man, wait a minute. We're, it's got to be 50-50 here. Well, that's how it has to be in the gym. It's got to be give and take. And until you people understand that, you're holding yourself back. You're limiting yourself. And another thing, for, for superior people, guys who are really gifted, you know, awesome. Sometimes you hit the limit at your gym. Sometimes you just need to go somewhere else where there's more people of your caliber, okay? Because while everybody says, and it's just, this is kind of funny, no matter what it is, the skill set, they'll always tell like a mediocre person, always play with somebody better. That's true. But the better person, if all he's doing is playing with lesser people, he'll sink to that level, okay? Because there's no, there's no challenge anymore. So for guys out there that are and gals that are studs in the gym, you know, some, if, you know, sometimes you may have to go somewhere else to get pushed to that next level. You know, um, I didn't have that option because it wasn't like the gyms now. You know, I had to just get as good as I could with what I had. But you guys don't have that problem. You, you, there's plenty of gyms that you could go to, and, and, and maybe you'll be top dog in the next gym. Maybe you won't. Hopefully you won't. You know, this way you can rise to the top there too. So that's my little take on it. Yeah, I think that that's a really, really important, um, really good way to look at things. And I think you have to have – a level of trust between you and your other training partners so you could put yourself in vulnerable positions and experiment like you were saying you got to be able to experiment and you can't if you're just trying to win all the time and, and do what you're good at you're never going to put yourself in these vulnerable areas and experiment and try these new things but if you don't trust your training partners if you think he's gonna you know break your neck or hyperextend your arm you're never going to do that. You're never going to experiment. So, yeah, I think there's got to be a level of trust that you have to do that. And like you were saying, if, if you're training with somebody that's not as good as you, you know, maybe somebody that's way below your ability, that would be the time to, you know, put yourself in these vulnerable positions so that you can work and, and um, you know, make it a little bit more difficult for you as well and let him work. Maybe put you – let them put you in submissions and try to work out of them or something. There's always some way you can improve. But if you're just going full blast on somebody that's way below your level, nobody's really benefiting from that. You know? Well, you know, you, you, you very succinctly said it, you know, um, also look at it this way. You got guys who let's say may have 30, 35, $40,000 cars or whatever their cars are worth. They could be, Older hot rods that aren't worth that much, but maybe they're worth twenty, twenty-five thousand. And you're like, hey, can I borrow the keys? Can I take your Chevelle for a ride? Are you out of your mind? That's my pride and joy. You know how much time and effort I put into that car? I would never let you take the keys of that car. I love that car. I've had that car for five, six years. I did all the body work to it. I worked hard on that car all the weekends. That car is worth twenty-five thousand dollars. You think I'm gonna give you the keys of the car? No. Okay. Hey, can I put you in some neck cranks and toe holes? Yeah, come on. Let's go work out. Are you out of your friggin' mind? Do you know if I blew your ankle or popped your neck, it's going to probably be a hell of a lot more than $25,000 it's going to cost you. So you can sit there and you can put so much thought and love and honor and respect into an automobile or whatever it is because all the hard work you put into the car. What about the hard work you put in your own body? Okay. So you're right. This is where the trust comes into play. Okay. So if I can't trust you with the car, I, am I going to be able to trust you with my body here? Drill on me, drill this top wrist lock 500 times tonight. And that number is not an exaggeration people. That is how it was in my training. Sometimes 500 or more just over and over. Each one takes about two or three seconds. So 500 isn't all that long. It's not like 10 hours. Okay. You know, so you got to think about all of this, you know, use your nagging a little bit, but it does boil down to a relationship, a marriage in the gym. And it's a trust. Now, that being said, um, Lou always warned me later on, you know, uh, that I was a target, you know, don't let these guys drill on you because they'll take a cheap shot. You know, they'll purposely crank on you so they could say they got you. 
when you're completely allowing people to do it. You know, and he has a point because I did run into some jerk offs that try to do that. You know, um, when you're just completely compliant over and over here, just drill, tap me, tap me, tap me, tap me, right? That word. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, go, okay. Oh, I tapped Tony 10 times. You never tapped me once, period. And you never can. I'm giving it to you. I'm allowing you to drill. These are the types of people you throw them, get them out of the gym, go. And if they're doing that to you, let's say there was a partner that you were working with and he, he started that shit. Oh, I tapped out uh, Nico 10 times. I'd have a talk with him and say, you didn't tap out anybody. You're drilling. He's allowing you that hold. And if, if that attitude continues, you got to get rid of him. You, you, you know, back then when I was training everybody, I wasn't charging anybody anything. I was just training them. Then when I started later on, people come and taking advantage of it. No, you, you're going to pay because what you're getting, you can't get anywhere. So it's worth a lot of money to, to learn. But no money is worth your dignity and your honor. And no money is worth watching me watching somebody that I care about. One of my students like you, Nico, for example, you know, getting put through an emotional ringer here from some, some guy who's, who's running on ego. We don't need those types of people in our lives, babe. No, let them go somewhere else. So that's, you know, that's why I had a lot of times a reputation of being a hard nose. Cause I wouldn't let these guys pull that shit, you know, and we should have talked about this when Javier was there. Cause somebody tried to get snippy with Javier. And I told the guy, try it with me. Now I'm right now. Try it on me. Try it. And you know, and I lost my cool because nobody is going to try to hurt Javier. Nobody. Not in my, not in, not as long as I'm alive. And nobody's going to hurt you or Joe or, or anything, anybody I care about, especially when I'm there. So yeah, it's all about getting along in the gym. Leave the ego at home, please. So, I mean, you know, you never got to co go to any of the gyms, Nico. You know, you, you only trained each here at my house, which was great because that's that's how I learned and that's how, you know, I'm sure others have too, you know, in people's garages, in their basements, in their backyards, so on. But um I take this shit seriously. And you know me, you you've seen how my attitude changes when I'm in the gym or when I'm on the camera talking about this stuff. I'm serious as a heart attack. But when we're out for the pizza or we're out just having a couple of beers or something, I'm different. I'm, I'm you know I'm laughing, I'm checking the girls out, you know, we're you know, we're having fun. Joe knows that because, you know, <laughs> Joe's been around to some of the places in Chicago with me. Yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> what are you looking at, Joe? You're married. And Joe would always say, oh, no, no, I'm just looking at the jukebox. I wonder if they have, you know, any, you know, blood, sweat, and tears on the jukebox. Well, it's hard for me to keep my eyes off you, Tony. I try, but. Oh, yeah, well, you're not alone. You're not alone, man. Thank well, I know that. Nico has to wrap things up. So any other closing thoughts, coach? Oh, is it 8.30 already? Well, he had to go a little bit before, closer to 8. So. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't hear that. Oh, no, I guess we're going to make this a short one then. Well, real quick, before we get off, do you have any tips for someone? Let's say somebody's looking for a gym. Do you have any tips? No. For someone, what they should look for and what they should, you know, kind of well, look out for? Well, yeah, honestly, first and foremost, let's be honest. Everybody looks at the bottom the bottom line, the, the money, okay? But sometimes you just – you have to set money aside. Maybe you can't start this month. Maybe you can start in three months and just start saving a little bit of money. <clears throat> so if we can take money off the table, you want to look for an instructor that will take care of you, that will get to know you, that you won't be just a body – but you will be a body and soul. And you don't want an instructor to that, that only focuses on your body. You need one who will focus on your soul. Get to know you. Get into your heart. See what your insignificant uh, defects are. Not your insignificant, but your defects are. You know, anything that would, you know, make you kind of poor and, uh, and wrong to try to get to know you so you can, he can, Get rid of all those problems, all those faults in you, you know, as opposed to, all right, give me 20 jumping jacks and do your, you know, do your thrust punches. That, you know, you don't need that unless, unless, unless you're just looking for the camaraderie. But, um, yeah, and you need, and you want, 
you need to know that your coach knows what he's doing. He or she. You know, it, it's if, if and here's another big important thing. You do have to follow what your coach tells you. It is his gym. Okay. So if you are in a Taekwondo school, let's use that as an example. I'm not knocking Taekwondo. But if you're in a Taekwondo school and all you want to do is grapple and do submissions, you're in the wrong school. Okay. So and the same thing conversely, if you want to just practice your kicks all day long. You know, don't go to a, let's say, a grappling only school, you know. So, um, and and as far as what, what to look out for, attitude. Okay, if you see a lot of guys that are like trying to just, you know, intimidate or just walk around strutting, you know, that, that can really work against you. Because I've seen martial arts schools, taekwondo schools and shit, um, that you weren't allowed to ask the instructor, the master, the Korean master, any questions. You had to ask an advanced belt student. Okay, so no matter what school you're in, you should be able to go up to a student and ask that student questions. You shouldn't have to be afraid to talk to your teammates or whatever you want to call it, your classmates. So I, I really do believe that there has to be an attitude there that, that's uh, you know very constructive you know, that's my belief. Um, so money, you got to make sure you can afford it. Uh, find an instructor that actually cares about you as a human being. Three, can bring the goods. It has the skill to, to teach you. And fourth, the overall atmosphere, you know, that, it, that it's safe. It's, you know, conducive for you to learn. And, um, you know, music is a big thing, too. You got to watch for that because sometimes, you know, there's some gyms, you know, I know he's I know he's probably watching, but Jason Bender, I love you, man. But damn, with the music, you know that I'm deaf in one ear and I can hardly hear out of my left ear. And I I can't hear you guys with that music going, man. So I'm I like don't like to have music on because it's I can't hear. But for other people, they may not like the music. I mean, that those that particular music and they they, they can't get into it. So you got to just, you know. There's a lot to look at, but if you know anybody who's seriously like um, curious, have them email me if I know the school or I can look into the school or I can even call the school for them and say, hey, I, I, I'm Tony Cicchini. Um, you probably know of me. I'm Joe Cardinal, the guy with the most beautiful hair in the world. I'm a friend of his. We have this guy that wants to train with you. What's your per curriculum? What's your program like? You know, blah, blah, blah. I'd be willing to do that for you, Nico. I'm just asking for the listeners. I mean, I, oh, I, yeah, I kind of well, know what to look for as, as well as you, and I agree with everything you just said. Even about Joe's hair? Oh, totally. I agree 100%. Yeah, I hope he gets that Rapunzel gig, man. I really, really do. Hey, Joe, if you do, um, is there any chance that, like, I mean, I know that you'd be working for Disney and all that, but, I mean, there's maybe some kind of cross-pollination. Is there any chance that we could get, like, you know, maybe Bugs Bunny. I know he's not Disney, but I kind of like Bugs. Can we get Bugs oh, Bunny on the podcast? Far superior to Disney, man. Oh, don't get me started. Yeah, hey, he's. You know, what's up, Doc? Not even the same category, boy. Oh, I know. There's a hierarchy, and like Bugs is number one. I think Popeye probably number two. The Disney stuff is way at the bottom. I, I it's agree. a shame they've really taken over. You know, what about the? Yeah. Where the you know, you just uh, used to smoke and uh, you know chase single moms and get in bar fights. That's the kind of cartoons kids need to watch, right? I'll tell you this right now. Everybody knows this. Betty Rubble was hot. She was very attractive. And you know it, Joe. Don't lie. Okay? It was always about Betty Rubble. I mean, I know a lot of people like redheads. Okay, you can have Wilma. You know. No, I, I think I'm with you. I think Betty, Betty would definitely be, you know. And don't forget, and don't forget who who Fred knew. Okay. You don't want to really go after Betty because she's married. You don't want to, you don't want to do that to Barney, but you know what? Um, Ann Margrock. Now she was single Ann Margrock was yes. And she could, she could sing you to sleep too. She did it to, for pebbles and you got better hair than pebbles. Mm. So I guess that's the end of the show guys. Cause Nico's got to go. But um, we will see you for sure next week. We're, we're just trying to get our schedules 
to jive here. It's been difficult, but um, we'll make it work, right? What do you have to say? You guys, I'm done talking, so you guys do your closing. No, it's definitely a good show. It was good catching up. I think a lot of good points were made. See you guys yeah. next time. All right. All right. All right. See you guys next time. Thank you. Next time. Um. Thank <laughs> you.